I'm afraid my generation had a fixation with the Second World War, and that's because we were brought up on an unremitting diet of the stuff. Shiver me flipping timbers, lads. Now's our chance to give these Nippon noodle noshers a touch of the old commando crunch. My father fought in Burma, and from what I know, the reality was rather different from the adventures in the comics I read when I was six. In December 1941, when Britain was fighting for its survival against Nazi Germany, a new empire in the East entered the war. The British colonies of Hong Kong, Malaya, Singapore and Burma were all overrun by the Japanese in a brilliant campaign threatening the crown jewel of the British Empire, India. Churchill raised an army of a million men to fight back. These men not only stopped the Japanese advance, eventually they defeated them, turning the tide of the war in the east. By Shinto, the white pigs are too strong for us. Retreat. But unlike Captain Hurricane, most of the men that fought in Burma were not white. Elwyn Rhys Jones was a medical officer with the Gold Coast Regiment, and the men he served with were West Africans. This is the story of that forgotten army. If I mean to find out what happened, I haven't actually got much to go on. There are a few photographs buried deep in the pile of family snaps. They show men marching and men on ships. All right, now... Astonishingly, I've also discovered a few watercolours painted by my father at the time. They conjure up a tropical world of huts and tents and lost temples in the jungle and wartime casualties. These are new, but I'm looking for something I remember rather better. Ah, now, OK. Now, this is the photograph that I distinctly remember from being a boy which shows uh, my father, newly qualified as a doctor, as it were, sitting amongst a group of, of West Africans. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, but he never really talked about it. I'd like to know a little bit more about this. What did you do in the war exactly, Daddy? And who are these West Africans with you? What were they doing there? And why do we so seldom hear about them? My father died in 1989, but my mother Gwyneth is still alive. Though she didn't meet Elwyn until after he came back from the war, I'm hoping she can shed some light on what happened to him. You say to people, my father went to West Africa, and their eyes pop out of their head, and they say, what were West what Africans was he doing? In doing? West Africa? <laughs> they were going to West Africa, to take troops to Burma. I've never been clear about whether he was, he was actually involved in, in fighting. He actually went with the men, so he told me, into battle. But you so see, I've never been, heard that. Because, I never knew. But I must have asked him, what did he do? And that's what he told me. I needed more information. And the War Office provided my father's record. The identity card for the army in India. And there he is, in a massive coat. For some reason, not looking at the camera at all. This is an extraordinary document. Special uh, knowledge or experience, he is a casualty surgical officer, Cardiff Royal Infirmary. And then the campaigns, uh, Burma 3. Burma 3? These papers give me little more than the bare facts of his military career. I learn that he was called up towards the end of 1941 and after basic training near Leeds, was posted to West Africa, where he served with the Gold Coast Regiment. It was part of the 82nd West African Division. So I've arranged to meet up with some white veterans who went with them to Burma. Uh, let me le lead you in this way. We're going to be in here and... Harry, 
Haven't seen you for a long time. I'm afraid I can't see you, but... <laughs> oh, dear. Welcome. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Morris Ramsey. Yes, I haven't long... seen you for 20 years or more, I suppose. I, I should think it's 30 or 40. Is it? Is it? <laughs> Gracious. <laughs> I haven't a clue. I, I was a country boy. I'd, n I'd never lived in a big city or anything like that. I'd never seen a black man. To the best of my recollection, I'd never seen a black man. That's the badge of the 82nd West African Division. The division that my father was a member of, or signed to. In the battalion, there are about 1,200 men, uh, consisting of about 26 Europeans and the rest African troops. I developed malaria in Burma, and the medical officer might have been your father. A regimental medical officer uh, was with the troops, essentially, uh, an integral part of the four companies that make up a battalion. A very difficult job and a very traumatic job because he would feel the full weight of all the casualties with a number of trained uh, African uh, dressers. Apart from one exception, all of the officers in the West African divisions were white. My father was one of three medical officers in his division. He looked after 3,000 men and the vast majority of these were black Africans. How and why were these Africans and my father thrown together to fight the Japanese in the jungles of Asia? I've come to where my father's regiment was raised in Ghana. When he came here in 1943, this was a British colony called the Gold Coast. The idea that Britain is on its own in 1940, of course, is a myth. It might have been on its own in Europe, but it had a vast empire. It was an empire which was constructed on race, white superiors, black inferiors. And I don't think many people questioned that. I mean, they thought of it as part of the wallpaper of the modern world. West Africa becomes more important in wartime because the empire would be mobilised to protect itself as well as Britain. This was a huge military power on a global scale, scattered around the world with garrisons and, of course, manpower uh, to fight the war. service record, disembarked West Africa, 10th of the 5th, 43, and then posted to the 37th General Hospital for duty, which is here. My father had just qualified as a doctor in Cardiff, and despite a course in London, he can't have had much first-hand experience of tropical diseases. Hello? Dr. Stephen O'Day runs a clinic in Accra. He's spent a lifetime working in tropical medicine. He's also made a study of the West African divisions and their part in World War II. The usual battle with malaria, yes. Those with resistance shake it off very easily, but it does kill, particularly uh, young people. But for the British Army, for an army in battle, Malaria was a problem because people became un unfit to fight. Yeah, because they did not have any resistance to malaria whatsoever. But when the West African troops reached Burma, they went with them, they took along with them their resistance against the malaria. And that's one of the reasons they were sent to Burma. Because they could handle the terrain and the environment better than the British soldiers. I read from a surgeon, he said, when you considered going into the jungle, a doctor felt 50% defeated already. Yes, that's right. The Burmese jungle was one of the worst uh, theatres of war during the last war. In the heat, in the humidity and so on, it is a breeding ground of bacteria of the salt. So when it came to surgery, it was not just a question of operating on the war casualties by developing infection, by developing other 
you know, uh, post-operative uh, problems and so on, the person dies. My father arrived here and he would have a big learning curve to come up to speed on tropical medicine. Actually, his station will have a clutch of people around him, male nurses, medical ovaries, yes. stretcher bearers. They were the mainstay. Medical orderlies could be so good. When the medical officer came from England, the medical orderly trained him to be able to handle their local conditions. My father retained a great affection for his team. He must have come to rely on the training and experience of these men surrounding him. But I wonder if there are any still alive in Accra who might have memories of this war or of him. The British High Commission in Ghana have organized a special dinner for Gold Coast veterans. How old are you now, Freddie? I'm 91 years. 91 years old? All right. Since okay. about 1922. OK. He was very young at the time. Yes. Uh -huh. He joined. He was, tw he was 24, I think, when he started. Uh -huh. One of the veterans, Kofi Norte, served as a medical orderly in my father's regiment. This is a photograph of my father. My... Oh! I knew you did it. Yeah, Dr. Jones. He worked in the military hospital here. Yeah. yeah. I was here night before we went to the Yeah. So I know, I know him very well. I was among men who the trainers that we are going to is he here? Oh, I'm, I know him very well. That was the medical officer uh -huh. for your brigade? But, uh, yeah. He looks a little bit like you, but he had a very broad face. Yes. He did, yeah. He was a man who wouldn't tolerate rubbish. He didn't tolerate rubbish. You can't argue with him. No. He was a little bit harsh. 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 Was he? OK. Well, I, that's slightly how I remember him, too. He could be quite uh, strict. It's a remarkable experience to meet these gentlemen, to meet these old men, most of them in their 90s, who... who, who seem to... I mean, I mean they're, just, they're just wonderful men. The, uh, the Kofi, in particular, uh, was such a, such a wonderful, gentle soul. He worked at that hospital as a medical orderly under my father. But um, it is extraordinary to meet that tangible link with, with the past. Men like Kofi, Stephen and my father were brought together by events taking place 10,000 miles away in another part of the empire. The enemy swept down to central Burma along the road to Mandalay. We just need to cast our minds back to 1942 to realize the enormity of what had happened. All of a sudden, the Japanese had destroyed British control of Burma. By May, the Japanese had reached right up into the borders of India, the great jewel in the crown. And the feeling of um, threat uh, that uh, was engendered uh, in India was intense. <laughs> Tropic patchwork, races, creeds, countries by the dozen. But crossing over to fight in Burma, Negroes get together, proudly say we're all West Africans. My father and the others from Britain were there to defend the empire. But why did men like Kofi join up to fight a white man's war? I was a young boy, 17 or 18 years. During that time, I knew nothing about the war. I was fitting shop, we are working, and I heard drumming, boom, 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 marching. They are marching. So I run away and go and look. Then they say, anybody who wants to join the army, you should come. They break. I took myself, I go myself. I don't care, tell my mother, I don't tell my father. So I joined the army. And one time they take me, they write my name. 
Many people who are recruited into the army in West Africa don't necessarily know about the war, let alone the causes. This is employment. It's going to pay a wage and give you a uniform and feed you. So in a sense, they have no sense of allegiance to uh, an empire. If they have an allegiance, it's one that they originally had with a chief, and then they transfer it in some sort of way and partially to a, a, a white British officer. Recruiting was only the first step. These young men needed to be made into soldiers good enough to face the Japanese in the jungles of Burma. I'm on my way to meet veteran Joshua Enin at his home in Accra. Joshua, who turns 90 this year, joined the 81st West African Division in 1942. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Thank you for having me here at your house. Thank you. To yeah. be able to meet you. It's a pleasure, you. yes. That's... My training, basic training, and they give you a train how to shoot, how to march, yeah. and all sort of things. You do yeah. everything. Acrobatics, you have to scale on the wall with your rifle, yeah. so many things. Was that a tough time in basic training? The first few months was very, very tough. It was to the time, to the clock, 5.30 a.m., the big clock goes, pum, 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 pum. You have your rifle, your boots, you're fully dressed. We have your have a sack, your big pack, your ammunition pouch, you, your mortar, you know, you carry mortar and ammunition in your pouch here. And with the rifle, you will have to, you know, scale a rope. See, this sort of uh, jungle warfare yeah. was very, very tough. And I can I tell you, honestly, one of our chaps ran away. But I was so determined. I was so determined, uh, I stayed on. And I tell you, I, I always tell people that my going in the army has made me what I am today. Joshua told me how the West African divisions, including my father, were taken for intensive training. For Joshua, this was to take nearly six months. Here in central Ghana, the modern equivalents are still going through it today. One, two, three, one. There was a sort of thought in Whitehall that Africans lived in jungles. In truth, most of the recruits were, were born, bred, and, and, and grew up in grasslands. And so the jungle was a completely new thing to them. Before World War II, the West African regiments were primarily a local militia used to help maintain order and patrol the borders. But High Command believed that what the West Africans lacked in battle experience was made up by their willingness to follow orders. And perhaps more importantly, their tradition of head carrying gave them a unique ability to transport supplies through the difficult jungle of Burma. The fighting in wars often takes place in the most awful conditions. In this case, in the deepest jungle. Jungle which had been assumed to be too impenetrable for anybody to fight in. And so what happened? The, the Japanese took advantage of that fact and it became a jungle fight. And that meant that suddenly the British Army were forced to completely rethink and work out a whole training system for fighting back in the deepest and most difficult of terrains, the jungle. Well, we're on ambush training, and now we're approaching a sort of clearing in the jungle, I think. To be honest, I'm not sure what's going on at all. But I imagine that was pretty much what war was like as well. When you are walking in the jungle, you don't talk. No. Mm. So maintaining a sort of silence so we was we use hand signals. Yeah. But you see, they are talking. So definitely, as they approach, the people know that they are coming. You know, prepare for them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, they 
there. You can see that. We can't see them. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. We can't see them at all. Can't. They're effectively dead. Look at one there. Yeah. Look at one there. Yeah. <laughs> Those who end, if you are not lucky and the blood doesn't touch you, you stay in, on the ground. No. Then crawl to safety. Veteran Stephen Mingle remembers the brutality of his jungle training. The jungle training was all about warfare. Guns are being shot at certain height, and you crawl under, under the gunfire with your big pack and everything behind your back. If you raise up your head, you 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 will die. But we lost two soldiers who raise up their head and. They, 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 they received gunshot wounds and died. Born fit, toughened by the toughest climate in the world, their muscles are still not strung taut enough to face jungle warfare. Veteran Joshua Neen completed his jungle training in the summer of 1943. 70 years later, he's still remarkably fit, and he's agreed to travel back to Burma with me to share his experiences of the campaign. While my father and the 82nd Division remained behind, still training in Africa, Joshua and the 81st were assembled at Lagos in Nigeria and sent to war. News got around that we are moving tomorrow for Burma, India, to fight the Japanese. And uh, those who were frightened ran away. How did you feel as you set off? Uh, I felt that it was an adventure in, in my life. You know, I didn't have any responsibility. I know what I wanted. I've joined the army to go to war and do the best. And morale was good on the whole, do you think? The morale was perfect. Comradeship. You know, it was Comradeship was strong. It was very strong. Yeah. You, whether you were Nigerian, whether you were in the house, it was very, very strong. We went as a as a, as a family, we behaved like a family. The journey from West Africa to Burma takes us 26 hours. But for Joshua and the 81st West African Division, it took six weeks. They sailed around Cape Hope and across the Indian Ocean. In September 1943, Joshua disembarked in Bombay and travelled across the subcontinent by train to a military camp in a place called Chittagong, where he was held for three months. The country that Joshua and my father were preparing to fight for had been part of the British Empire since 1886. It had taken the British 60 years to conquer Burma. They forced the last Burmese king into exile and made Burma into a province of Imperial India. The colonial regime quickly left its mark on the entire place. Even here, at Burma's most sacred site, the Shui Gong Pagoda in Rangoon. 2,600 years old. You, you almost can't look up at the main pagoda because the five tons of gold leaf and uh, gold plate reflects so much sunlight that it literally dazzles you. This is the largest and most precious symbol of the whole of Burma. But the British are pretty good at symbols as well. So when they first invaded, they set up a military headquarters in this place. By the end of the 19th century, the British Empire had reshaped the capital of Rangoon in its own image. This abandoned building, the Secretariat, was built as the great colonial seat of power in Burma. I've come here to meet Tant Mi and U to find out what the Burmese felt about their country becoming a battleground between the Japanese and British empires. Here, the sort of colonial regime was very much born as a military occupation. In the 1880s and 1890s, there was an enormous resistance to British rule. It was put down at the cost of thousands of, of lives, hundreds on the British side, thousands on the Burmese side. I think it was very clear that Burma was seen strategically as the country that was going to protect India's eastern flank. 
uh, and as a possible sort of backdoor to China, uh, as well as a place to make profits uh, in its own right. So the Japanese march in to Rangoon. What was the attitude of the, of the Burmese population? There was a core of Burmese nationalists who had turned to the Japanese, who came in with the Japanese during that invasion, who were very excited at the prospect that the you know, British Empire was falling and there was a chance for independence. And so thousands of people rallied to this new Burma nationalist army that was set up by the Japanese. In 1940, Yangon, Rangoon, was part of a, of a huge industrial supply line. So the Japanese were coming here for two main reasons. The first was to try and stop American supplies getting to their long-term enemies, the Chinese, with whom they'd been fighting a war since the early 1930s. And the second was to get hold of oil, oil and rubber. And these industrial products were what they came to this largely agricultural country to fight a huge battle over. As an island empire, Japan desperately needed more resources to wage war. And by June 1942, the Japanese held all of Burma and were sitting right on the border of the richest possession of the British Empire, India. The following December, the British tried to strengthen their position by counter-attacking the Japanese in Arakan, a mountainous jungle territory that ran along the Bay of Bengal from southern Burma up into India. But their campaign ended in humiliating defeat. A year later, they tried again, and this time the 81st West Africans were sent in too. This is Bagan, and about 150 miles due west of here is where Joshua first entered the jungle to try and regain this country for the British Empire. <laughs> here we are. Come and meet some of the people. Hello. How do you do? Hello. Come on, come on. <laughs> My name is Joshua. <laughs> when Lance Corporal Enin arrived in Burma, a meeting like this would have been highly unlikely. Many of the people living in the country sided with the Japanese. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Thank you. So the army never went near the villages? No, Lois camped so many miles away from the villages. But occasionally you would see Burmese people. Well, we see them occasionally. Yeah. When they, they pass by with their bullock trucks. And what did they, what did, I mean, generally they kept out of your way? Yes, and we were also, we were trying, they were asked to keep out of our way. That's right. right. That's what. Right. Yeah. And, and you were asked to keep out of their out of way? Their way. Why? That's right. Because we, we're afraid there might be some informants amongst them who might communicate or uh, inform the Japanese about our movements. Today, this region is called the Rakhine State, and there's been serious fighting between Buddhists and Muslims, and we can't film exactly where Joshua went. But we can get to the jungle on the other side of this mountain range, which is very similar terrain to where he faced the Japanese. We are what we call the lead attack, mm. where we are going to pass to attack the Japanese. There were cliffs covered in jungle. Yes. And rivers running through them. True, yes. And these dogs, this, uh, what do you call this? Hyena, are they hyena? Hi. They are dogs. Yeah. They, haul, they are all over the place. And very short, short snakes. Arakan was a remote, difficult to access region. It was jungle, it was mountain, climate, disease. It, there were very, very few routes. And troops who were thrown into it had to overcome not just the Japanese, but this extraordinary terrain. Well, we will have the observation men look at the place, hmm. survey the area, 
they would give us instructions once they've surveyed and they've had information about the enemies, their location, they would give us the instruction and then we would plan our movement routes. Right. And that was all the platoon setting yes. off yes. individually with instructions coming from signals saying yes. you're gonna have to go round that round that round that hill there, yes. go round the jungle yes. there, come up come that up, cliff yes. there and prepare yourselves That's because right. the enemy are on the other yes. side. That's right. Men who lived in upcountry villages who had worked for land. Many West Africans were infantry soldiers, but even these fighting men had to carry all of their equipment through dense and hilly terrain. For Private Alfred Asharife, these gruelling marches in the humid jungles proved too much. We walked in the jungle, my full march order, big have a sack and my rifle, and this place my machete, two parties here, full of ammunition. I know this, my heart and everything. When I got tired, I couldn't march again, I couldn't follow. I, was, I haven't got the strength, the stamina to walk, I fell off. And when, when I walk, I'm feeling dizziness. So I fall down and I lie. I couldn't walk again. So my, my, my company left me in the bush. They just leave it, they come and take my rifle. I alone in the bush, about one, Good month before another, it is second division come and meet me. That my 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 moment that God has sent me. This is a patrol just setting out. The men are often out on reconnaissance for five days and nights on end. In the jungles of Arakan, Joshua and the 81st, alongside two Indian divisions, encountered the Japanese for the first time. The fighting was brutal and often hand to hand. At one point, the Japanese overran an allied field hospital and murdered 35 unarmed medical staff and their patients. It was a bruising initiation for the West Africans, but despite heavy casualties on both sides, for the first time, the allied forces overcame their ferocious enemy. The Japanese fled, leaving 5,000 dead in the field. But the Japanese were not about to accept defeat. A month later, they launched a full-scale invasion of India. While Joshua and his comrades held Arakan, the mass of Japanese troops struck further north, attacking from central Burma, the Indian towns of Imphal and Kahima. The garrison of British and Indian infantry dug in and held on to a hill position overlooking the town. It's important to understand Arakan, Imphal and Kahima as a single campaign. It was a part of the, a single Japanese strategy to break into India and to topple the Raj. The joint battles of Imphal and Kahima were the turning point of the war in the Far East. They've been likened to the Battle of Stalingrad, and Battle of Al Alamein and Midway as significant turning points in the Second World War. For 13 days, the garrison held out against a force three times its strength. For the first time, the Japanese were defeated in large numbers and were forced out of India. Patrols went out to make contact with the enemy, and soon the battle was joined. This was the first major Japanese defeat of the war. General William Slim, commander of the 14th Army, decided to pursue the retreating Japanese and attempt to retake Burma. While the main force pushed down the center of the country, towards the plains, the West African mission was to clear the Japanese 28th Army out of the jungles of Arakan. My God, terrible. I became frightened. Because I was very young, at the age of 20, you see? So I became frightened because these people, uh, the Japanese, they were on top of the tree and said, snappers, snappers. One held a battalion for so many hours on a tree top, was using a grenade, a gun at the same time, pistol. But when he was being one of our snappers, shot him down. The Japanese soldier was probably the most ferocious fighting animal that any British soldier has ever had the misfortune to fight. He handed his life in this world and his afterlife to the emperor. He sent nail clippings and quantities of his hair back to his family to demonstrate that his life was now in the hands of the emperor. Ultimately, the soldier's responsibility as a samurai was to die. They would leave snipers and trees and ambushes all over the place. They were fiercely determined and they would continue on until they died.
By the time my father and the 82nd Division arrived here in December 1944, Joshua had been in the jungle for almost a year. And while his fighting was coming to an end, my father's was just beginning. Walking in this countryside, my father's watercolours come alive. I realise that I'm seeing the same landscapes that he painted all those years ago. The 81st West African Division had already fought the Japs in 1943, and the arrival of the 82nd Division in 1944 meant double trouble for the enemy. There's an entry in the service record which says, entered concessional area. I had no idea what that meant, but it means he enters the war, the battle area. I don't know why I found that so chilling when I first read it. It's just there's something sort of euphemistically army speak about it, something bureaucratic. This is the Burmese hill jungle. It's oddly autumnal because it's the dry season, which was also the fighting season. Sometimes the uh, going was pretty difficult. There's a diary entry for March the 3rd for the regiment, which says that they had a cut every inch of the way, and another which says that uh, one day they managed to move about 500 yards. But on average, the aim was to get about eight miles in one day. At this stage of the campaign, the whole war became totally mobile. There was no sense of a, of a front line. All the units were moving south. The entire division covered over 300 miles over the next nine months. This tactic was helped by a new strategy developed by General Slim that exploited Allied aerial superiority. When his troops were attacked by the Japanese, they would form a large defensive box, like a Roman legion, stand their ground and wait to be supplied by air. Sometimes they would have to hold out for days or even weeks. By all accounts, the night wasn't a particularly restful time. For one thing, the Japanese had a habit of attacking at night. And most of the regimental diaries are full of just references to jitters. Just the one word, jitters. And what it really meant was that the Japanese, under cover of night, would approach right where they thought the West Africans were camped out and try to get them to give themselves away. My father told me of a terrifying time when he was left alone in the jungle at night looking after casualties. I've also found evidence in the regimental diaries that puts him right in the middle of a fierce battle. By 1945, his division had cleared the enemy out of half of Arakan, but the Japanese were fighting a bitter rearguard action. When the 82nd moved to block their retreat at a place called the Anne Road, my father's brigade were completely surrounded. The enemy brought up more artillery and they brought up tanks, more mortars. They let two brigade have it. 
That's the 2nd Brigade. That's the brigade that my father was in. All attempts to gain the road were met by unyielding enemy resistance. The Japanese responded with continuous counterattacks and jitter parties. Some of the shelling caused heavy casualties in the brigade headquarters staff, aggravating the situation. Stephen Minker was a radio operator in the thick of the fighting. We were surrounded and we couldn't go forward or backward. They were shelling us. They killed so many of us. We lost so many officers. My brigadier, Brigadier Yi W. D. Weston, had his whole jaw shattered. Some of my friends were killed. Hama, Akulgu Farfa, and some others were all killed. The brigade priest who buried most of the soldiers, the following day he was also killed. I was also wounded when a shell fell. I felt some something in my stomach and my neck here. When I raised my battle dress, I saw my intestines coming out. I was calling for God to save us, that's all. My job is I'm, I'm, I'm stretch a barrier. Dangerous on the line. How they shoot, the uh, gun is shouting. The bomb is shouting. It's very, very dangerous. If you don't take care, you too will get it. Completely cut off, my father and his medical team had no access to the usual airlifts that took the gravely injured to the base hospitals that could save their lives. I'm meeting with Tom Hammond, an ex-Royal Marine commando and army medic in Iraq and Afghanistan, to try and find out what my father would have faced in the middle of this battle. Tell me what essentially his job under those circumstances is then. It would be, let's just get a, a semi-secure position. We might have had a, a jeep, a little bit of tentage, and a few boxes of supplies, and then the guys would be brought back to that, to that position. In those circumstances, what sort of wounds are you getting from being shelled? Massive high velocity injuries, so you know, arms and legs can get taken off, uh, penetrating um, injuries from the shrapnel, you know, sever arteries, huge catastrophic bleeding. You've then got head injuries and chest injuries, your major organs get damaged. Yeah, you're in a real tricky spot. What my mother told me was the worst thing that he felt he had to do during the war was say, leave him, take him. But under these circumstances, they're unable to pass on the really severely wounded to surgeons further back. They have to try and deal with them there and there. They're going to be overwhelmed. So at that point, he's going to make the, you know, the really difficult decision, which what your you know, mum talks about, um, to prioritise who he can actually give some benefit you know, to. So, for example, if 12 guys come in, you know, in one go, he can't deal with 12 guys all at one time. So he will look at the patients and he will kind of you know, triage them and say, you are beyond my help, you know. Right. Had that guy come in on his own... God, OK, he put... because, you, because what I thought, you see, what I thought was that actually this was all about should we take him back to the hospital or just leave him or whatever, but that this no. is actually... What he's talking about is an action like this, where, effectively, he's only got limited resources and he has to work out who he can, do, who he can help. He almost plays God, you know, because he'll be legs hanging off, he'll have to tie arteries off. The, guys, the guy that his jaw shot off, that's a horrific injury. Um, his, his airway is going to be compromised, and you know where are you going to go with him? If you if you put all your efforts into that one guy, everybody else suffers. So he's now doing surgery with shells going off and mortars coming in, and a constant stream of, of casualties. We we'll be, be under fire. I genuinely think I've had a different point of view there on what on why people didn't talk. Hmm.
After almost three weeks of desperate fighting, the 82nd West African Division was relieved by Nigerian and Gurkha regiments, and the Japanese were pushed back. That horrific sounding battle for the Anne Road was by no means the end of it. The West Africans seem to have continued to be engaged in a series of encounters with a pretty desperate Japanese force throughout April and into May. But by then, the war in the jungle was effectively over because they had captured the Arakan. The Allied victory in Burma was a massive blow to the Japanese, but they showed no sign of surrender. Slim's army of a million men now faced a brutal campaign to clear the Japanese out of Malaya and Singapore before invading Japan itself. On the 6th of August, 1945, the Americans dropped the atom bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. On the 9th, they dropped another on the city of Nagasaki. Six days later, the Japanese surrendered. So at last, on behalf of His Majesty the King and the peoples of the British Commonwealth and Empire, the Supreme Commander saluted the magnificent achievements of West Africa. So the news spread out. Everybody heard that well, now the Japanese have given up, uh, you know, they've surrendered, and, and so we've won, and, you know. And what did you feel? Well, we felt so, so proud and happy. <laughs> when we became victorious and we won the war, I was so happy that we'd been able to conquer the, the Japanese. The enemy is no more. So we shall all have our liberty and freedom. It's been hailed as the greatest British feat of arms of the entire Second World War and a triumph for General Slim and his strategies, which it was. But a lot of people are completely unaware that a huge amount of the fighting was done by Indian, Gurkha and African troops. But what about Burma? 70,000 men were killed or wounded in this war to win back Burma for the Empire. But it wasn't destined to stay in British hands for very long. Were the British welcomed back into Burma? I think a lot of people were, were very glad to see the back of the Japanese. But at the same time, the, world had, the, the war had sort of ignited this extreme nationalist feeling. And I think once the Burmese had a taste, even if it was a sort of nominal taste of, of independence, it was, very, it was going to be very hard to turn the, the clock back. For the empire, Burma had been seen as little more than a province of India. And with the end of the Raj imminent, she had lost much of her value. Burma in 1945 was in ruin. Almost every city and town in the country other than Rangoon was flattened by, by the war. And so I think the Labour government in 1946 took a very hard look at this country, uh, saw that it no longer had the strategic value it had, saw that there were nationalists agitating for the British to leave. But in the end, the choice was to, to quit Burma early. At the end of the war, the British Empire handed over power to Aung San, the leader of the Burmese Independence Army. He'd fought with the Japanese during the war, but changed sides in the last year. Shortly afterwards, he and half his cabinet were assassinated by dissidents in this building. Today, his daughter, Aung San Suu Kyi, is hailed as the champion of democracy in Burma. One can say in some ways that this is a place where World War II never ended. I mean, the British armed many of the minorities in this country to fight against the Japanese, which they did very ably. The Japanese armed the Burmese nationalists, who later on took over the government of this country. Uh, the Civil War led to the emergence of a very strong Burmese army, which then took over in, in 1962. So, so much of Burma's subsequent history, the last 70 years, was shaped by uh, the battlefields that were created in the, in the early 1940s here.
Thousands of the men who died in the jungle were buried there, but they are commemorated in a war cemetery in Yangon. There are recorded the names of the 27,000 soldiers of many races united in service to the British crown who gave their lives in Burma and Assam. The Caucasus Regiment, Christ, Sergeant Major, Awini Kanjaka. At the end of the war, General Slim, the commander of the Allied Army in Burma, personally thanked the West African soldiers for their service. The whole of the regiment was yes, lined, yes, up. lined up. Yeah. General Slim came. So he came to congratulate, you know, for all the things we've done, and that the crown is not going to let us down. But whatever happens, when we get back, we are going to be fully compensated. Joshua and his comrades returned to the Gold Coast in August 1945. But what should have been a joyous occasion was touched by tragedy. The British authorities had failed to inform the waiting families of any deaths. We had to march mm. with a regimental band mm. from the harbour to a camp. And these women were just hailing up. Hey. Mm. You know. When they saw me, they would come quickly to say, what happened to my brother? This was the first time that their families realised that their, their boys yep, were so not coming back. Coming. So such a person was my friend, he would just say, oh, Kwame now, Joshua, what happened to such and so Napoleon? Mm. And I would say, well, I'm sorry, Napoleon couldn't make it. Some of us even wept. That was the time some of us also we, we felt that emotion, you know, morally. After the war, Joshua Anin went to university in Britain. When he graduated, he came home to Ghana and became a senior civil servant. While most European soldiers were returning to civilian life, the 82nd West African Division was kept in Burma for nearly a year after the war finished, mopping up pockets of Japanese who refused to accept their country's surrender. In the summer of 1946, my father was still with them. He accompanied them on their journey back to the Gold Coast. Thank you very much. Hello. Good to see you again. I've come to say hello in your house. For stretcher bearer Kofi Norte, coming home was bittersweet. Thank you, thank you. How nice to meet you. If you are luck, we will come back. If you are not luck, my house, there, we are four brothers, and we went, we joined the army. I, I come back. The rest, they don't come back. I don't want to see war again because it's hard work. Very, it's not, it's not fine. I say war should come a country. I don't know. It's not good. For veterans like Kofi, life after the war was very difficult. Inflation had driven up prices and jobs were scarce. After playing their part in the Allied victory, veterans felt they deserved better. And they hadn't forgotten the promises made to them by General Slim. On February the 28th, 1948, Kofi and hundreds of the ex-servicemen gathered in the capital to voice their grievances. Well, we are right here. We haven't got gun. We don't come to fight. Nothing at all. We are going to see them. Government said we should come. 
I'm a policeman. He was not allowed us to go. Veteran Stephen Mingle had been shipped home early in 1945 after being seriously injured in the battle for Anne Road. When he recovered, he joined the Gold Coast Police and he was on the other side of the barricades under the command of the British head of police, Superintendent Imray. I was one of the men sent to the crossroad and a police officer called Imray came to stop them. They insisted of sending the petition to the governor. When he asked them to return, the air soldiers refused to go. Imre got annoyed, snatched the rifle from one of the policemen, and shot. He killed three people, there, my, my own officer. He shot the three men dead. Yeah. He just took the gun and yeah. shot them. Yes. Just dead, dead. The soldiers returned. And any vehicle they meet with a white man, on which they stop it, they overturn the vehicle. For the next week, rioters rampaged through the city, destroying white-owned businesses. When order was finally restored, a special commission was set up to investigate the causes of the unrest. Their conclusions led to radical change. If the Veterans March of uh, early 1948 had gone off peacefully, we wouldn't be talking about it. The fact that it was fired on it makes it a catalyst. And therefore we can see it as one of those critical events in Africa, those fatal shots, if you like, that ran out in Accra. And thereafter, the course of the history of the Gold Coast, future Ghana, is transformed. Less than 10 years later, in 1957, the Gold Coast became Ghana, the first African colony to leave the British Empire. When my father returned to the family home here in Wales in 1946, he came back to a different Britain. The empire that he'd been sent halfway across the planet to defend was disintegrating. Within a decade, India, Burma and West Africa had gained independence. The Labour government had come into power, introducing a radical social plan which would transform my father's world. Elwyn would spend the rest of his life working as an NHS doctor. It isn't really possible for me to say whether the war changed him, but it must have affected him. It was something that I think defined his generation. They had, throughout their life, he had a sort of sense of moral duty, which now, I sort of, I envy. I don't think he would have wanted to make a fuss about it. He was ordinary. He, he liked being ordinary. He relished when he got back a simple, ordinary, secure family life. And having seen what he went through, I, I suppose I can understand that a lot more clearly. And Griffries Jones is challenged by his own daughter tomorrow afternoon as he shares a taste of his life with Nigel Slater at 3.45. But coming next on BBC Two, it's Blackadder. <laughs> 